Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and module six on hazards. This is video number nine and we're going to be having a little bit of a look at volcanic eruptions and how they can affect the climate. The learning intention for this video is that you are able to analyze the effects of a major eruption on the climate both in terms of heating and cooling. And we're going to have a little bit of an introduction to this in this video then we'll look at specifically a case study in our next video so again go through the little checklist see where you are with this do you, could you already talk about the link between volcanic eruptions and climate if you can can you describe how a particular eruption could change the climate and then maybe we can look at a few different case studies and discuss a range of different changes that can be linked to volcanic activity. So I guess the first thing we need to do is we need to be really clear about what the climate is and how volcanic activity can um, change or at least potentially change what's going on in the climate. A lot of people use the terms climate and weather synonymously and they're not synonyms of one another. In fact, weather tends to be a short term frame, a uh, short time frame and climate a long time frame. So basically climate is the weather over a larger scale. It's often um, described as average weather conditions. One nice little quote that I saw is that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. So when we're talking about weather, we're actually talking about day by day, what's the maximum temperature? Is it gonna rain? What type of chance of rain is there? How hot is it? How humid is it? Climate is a sort of more of an overall pattern. It, it takes into account seasonality if you live in an area where there are distinct seasons. And also it takes into account uh, lots of other things that can impact on individual weather patterns. Things like El Nino or La Nina, two interesting effects that we've already uh, looked at previously in the year 11 course as to the impact that they can have on weather systems. Okay, so if climate is our long-term picture, it's our large scale uh, or long time frame effect of weather, then how or in what ways can volcanoes affect the weather? How can they affect long-term climate patterns? So what we wanna try and do then is we wanna try and look at our um, large scale volcanic activity uh, and what sort of impact that can have. And so the first thing that we wanna try and do is we wanna have a look at the production of gases. And this is gonna be one thing that's very important uh, because gas production can actually be linked to um, changes in certainly um, weather patterns over a short term, but potentially climate over that longer term as well. And the other thing that's gonna be important to talk about is particulate matter. Uh, small particles in the atmosphere that can be part of ash clouds and how they might be uh, influential in changing the climate patterns for some years afterwards. Now, when you're looking at um, climatic patterns or at least changes in weather, whether or not they are part of a short term or a long term plan, um, then you do want to think about the time frames. And in fact, what we sometimes see is that the change that happens as a result of a volcanic eruption in the short term is um, reversed then for, for what we might see happening in the longer term. So let's see if we can explore a few of the uh, potential consequences of volcanic eruptions in terms of the impact that they have on the climate. So one of the most important gases that is part of um, what we might find associated with volcanic eruptions is uh, sulfur dioxide. So sulfur is common, well, probably not necessarily common, but it's certainly one of the elements that we do find in magma. And it's uh, capable of reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere, and this produces the gas sulfur dioxide. Now, this too can uh, interact with oxygen, form the gas sulfur trioxide, but either of these two, and no, I haven't balanced this equation, but that's okay. Now, either of these two gases, sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide, sometimes you might see these referred to as SOX, which is um, the X like it is in mathematics, it's got a, a variable value. And these ones can lead to the formation of variations of sulfuric or sulfurous acid. And obviously, um, this is, can be a very uh, important component of rain. The conversion of these sulfate, uh, sulfur dioxide gas molecules into sulfate aerosols, and the sulfates are uh, an SO42 minus, which is now an ion. This is an ion. 
uh, and it too can uh, cr create these sorts of patterns of uh, acidic rain. Uh, so there's a there's a few little chemical reactions that are part of this process, and uh, we don't need to go into them in a lot of detail. But certainly, you can have a look at them in class or or on your own independently, to just to get a bit of an idea about how the the chemical processes. Uh, are occurring to make some of these important changes. So what's that got to do with climate? Well, the one that's got to do with climate is that these particles, these little tiny, um, think about an aerosol when you spray it and you get the tiny little liquid droplets and they kind of seem to uh, disperse, they can linger for some considerable time in the upper part of the atmosphere. So in behind this slide, you can see that this, the part of the atmosphere that's close to the surface of the Earth is the troposphere that's the stuff we breathe above that is the stratosphere and because of the amount of energy the particles can have when they're emerging from a volcano they can um, be basically blasted through the troposphere into the stratosphere and if that happens then they can be sitting around for very considerable periods of time in the stratosphere they may eventually come back to earth but their impact in the stratosphere can be quite significant. In fact, this can potentially lead to a form of global cooling because some of the particles are actually going to reflect some of the solar radiation that would naturally come to the Earth. Therefore, if the Earth doesn't receive the same amount of solar radiation, it's not going to heat up to the same extent. And therefore, we're going to have some um, type of uh, cooling or, or global cooling uh, as opposed to the global warming that we've talked about um, for some years now. To go through this I guess in a little bit more detail we need to talk about radiative uh, forcing and so basically what's happening with radiative forcing is that you're looking at that um, comparison between energy coming in to the earth and energy uh, leaving the earth. Now, obviously, if there isn't a balance between these two, if there's a balance between these two, then no um, heat exchange will occur. But if there is an imbalance between them, if there's more coming in than is radiating out, then we're going to have a heating effect. If there's more going out than there is coming in, then we're going to have a cooling effect. And so a lot of what we find is uh, associated with some of these uh, interactions between volcanic eruptions and climate change are associated with the measures around radiative forcing. So major eruptions can alter the Earth's radiative balance because of this aerosol cloud effect that we talked about previously. The aerosol clouds can take some of that radiation before it reaches the uh, surface of the Earth and um, radiate it back into space. Or we can find some scattering effects um, as a result of these aerosol clouds. And this is one of the reasons why once these particles get into the upper atmosphere, they can last for some significant period of time. And that time frame is why they affect climate. So once it becomes long term, and a couple of years is long term, we remember weather patterns are daily patterns. We talk about the daily weather patterns. But once they become longer term, once they're in the years, they are going to affect climate. They are going to start to change the way uh, air moves around the surface of the Earth. So therefore, that's going to affect some of the circulation patterns. That's going to affect high and low pressure systems. That's going to affect potentially how much, uh, what cloud formation and, and where clouds are coming and where they're going to drop their rain um, or other forms of precipitation. So each of these is kind of quite a big potential impact. Um, once we start talking longer term, and this is a kind of longer term time frame, then we're starting to talk about changes occurring in the climate. So what are some of the types of change that we can see? Well, eruption clouds that are composed of small rock particles or fragmented lava can cause local heating effects. So we can find that either a result of exothermic reactions that are occurring between some of the um, elements or compounds that are being released from the volcano and um, water in particular and as well as oxygen in the atmosphere they can generate um, heat through exothermic reactions and as we know um, magma within the earth and lava when it reaches the surface of the earth is very very hot 
and the heat is going to radiate away from that. You don't have to be standing on top of lava to know that it's very, very hot. That heat is going to radiate away from the source, and that's going to have a heating effect on the air primarily, but also um, on the land as well. Particles can act as what we call rain nucleation points. Now, if you know the Coke plus Mentos um, experiment, then you'll know that when you put some Mentos into Coke, it it creates more bubbles. You get a huge foam and the, and the Coke sort of tends to explode out of the bottle. And the reason that it does this is because of what we call nucleation points. So little tiny points that kind of think about them as acting like a catalyst and facilitating that um, chemical reaction to happen much quicker. So you get this, this um, formation of bubbles, you get all this gas build up, and of course it just pushes everything out. And the problem with um, particulate matter that's being released by volcanoes is they too can act as rain nucleation points. So starting that formation of rain, so water that's condensing and you're getting these clouds and so therefore you can increase both uh, rainfall and humidity on a local scale through through a volcanic eruption. Really dense um, ash clouds can block sunlight and actually lead to a drop in atmospheric temperature. So once again, we're talking about radiation um, coming into the earth or leaving the earth or perhaps bouncing off, this, off these ash clouds and not even reaching the earth in the first place. And again, that has an effect on uh, temperatures. And we can also have friction between particles and this can lead to large static charges. And you might've seen already, um, particularly the recent uh, volcanic eruption that was um, recorded around Tonga, um, had huge amounts of electricity associated with the ash cloud that was forming. And so you get a lot of lightning discharges as that static charge discharges. Um, and this can also have an effect on atmospheric ozone. So these sorts of lightning strikes can turn oxygen in the atmosphere into ozone. Now, as we know, ozone is a particularly good um, chemical in the stratosphere because it helps to form a layer um, that can protect us against some of types of ultraviolet radiation. But down in the troposphere, down in the level layer that we breathe, ozone's not good. And so um, if, if you want to play with balancing equations, do that. Um, but the important thing is we, we don't really want a lot of atmospheric ozone um, down in the tropospheric layers that we breathe. So these are all potential types of changes that can be linked with volcanic activity. Now the scale is what is, um, I guess, going to affect climate. So it's when we talk about scales that we can start to think about what are the effects on climate. So particles released from volcanoes can actually have a cooling effect. Remember, we need to talk about heating and cooling, and these cool the planet as they shade incoming solar radiation. And these cooling effects can last for months and potentially up to a couple of years. But volcanic activity has also been linked to previous global warming events in prehistory. So when we go back through the history of life and we see, particularly when we study some of the major extinction events, which we were looking at um, earlier in the course, we can see that there are some specific times where major volcanic eruptions have occurred uh, at a time corresponding to an extinction event. And we think that maybe these might have led to a large amount of uh, ash cloud activity, which was significantly cooling the earth, or perhaps it was um, a consequence of volcanic eruption that we ended up with a global warming episode, and that too had an impact on the organisms that were living at that time. One of the problems, of course, with vol volcanic uh, eruptions is the two most significant greenhouse gases, which is water, not always um, identified, and also carbon dioxide can be part of the volatiles that are in a magma, and therefore when they are released, particularly if they're released in a, a violent, dramatic fashion, they can increase the concentration of these in the atmosphere, and therefore, um, we know that they are linked to global warming, and so therefore that's a, that's a direct link between each of these two. When we talk about global cooling and global warming, what we tend to do once again is look at the time frames. So volcanic um, eruptions often in the short term can lead to um, a cooling effect, 
But what happens is that as those particles um, are released uh, into the stratosphere, they do some of their little radiation stuff, they create that sort of shielding effect, and therefore we have some cooling. But as they then return, one of the things that we can find is that over a longer period of time, they can uh, create a warming effect. And, and there's certainly been some eruptions that have been studied that seem to follow this kind of a pattern. In fact, the, the amount that we've learned about these, uh, the impact of partic particulate matter and potential nucleation sites and radiation effects is one thing that's led to the SPICE project. And the SPICE project, SPICE is Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering. And that's a fancy way of saying are there things that we can do to try and reverse some of the effects of global warming that we're seeing at the moment? And perhaps one of the ways is to try and um, create the sort of conditions that we find during or after volcanic eruptions and the impact that they can have on particles in the atmosphere. And so that's what this project is all about. Whether or not it's possible, feasible, practical, um, cost-effective, um, and of course, uh, environmentally effective to be able to put particles into the stratosphere, up into the higher uh, levels of the atmosphere of of the atmosphere, in order to uh, make some changes, make some rebalancing on global temperatures. But that's something that we might have a look at in class. Thanks for watching.